Now, I should probably start uh, by um, with this title uh, that I proposed for this uh, uh, webinar. Uh, what do I mean by dealing with exceptionality? Basically, uh, dealing, declaring a building to be exceptional or unique uh, is usually stated as a matter of fact, um, a fact that we seldom challenge uh, or question. In the realm of medieval Islamic architecture of Anatolia, uh, the classic example of a building perceived to be exceptional is the mosque hospital complex of Divri. And there's general consensus about its ex state of exceptionality and the perception that there is simply no other monument uh, quite like it. So here we have uh, a general view uh, uh, seen uh, from the, uh, the west uh, of this uh, complex uh, consisting of a mosque uh, and a hospital uh, joined together uh, from 1220-29, uh, both of them dated uh, to that year to 626 Hijri. Um, and then another view of the same uh, complex uh, uh, coming down uh, from uh, the citadel uh, and seeing it from a kind of an angle uh, with its uh, portals. Now, portals, um, the exceptionality of, Div of the Divri complex arises first and foremost from its entrance portals that are truly extraordinary in terms of the quality and density of the stone carved ornamentation and the overall design. Without these portals, it is unlikely that Divri would have been elevated so high up on the exceptionality ladder. The intense focus on these elements has meant that those aspects of the complex that are, let's say a bit more um, typical uh, for its period have not uh, garnered as much attention. My aim is not to negate the perception of exceptionality, but rather to delve uh, a little bit into how exceptionality is construed and emphasized, uh, as well as to consider what its implications might be. Before engaging in this question, it might be useful uh, for us to uh, go over very, very briefly uh, the salient aspects of the complex and its historical context, uh, just to make sure that everyone uh, um, is on the same page. Now, uh, as I said, this is a uh, complex uh, containing two um, discrete, in fact, discrete uh, institutions, a mosque and a hospital uh, located here uh, in the lower town. Uh, Divri also has a rather uh, impressive citadel uh, with a very ancient uh, history. Uh, we know that it was occupied uh, through the medieval period. Uh, there is, in fact, um, uh, an, an earlier mosque that was constructed uh, on the citadel at the end of the uh, 12th century. Um, the mosque hospital complex uh, was built uh, some 30 uh, to 40 years after that one. Um, uh, in the lower town, in, uh, in terms of scale, uh, the mosque hospital complex is really a very, very large uh, foundation. So it's a very large foundation in what is what was then probably not a very big town, uh, which is still not <laughs> a very big town today. Um, so this idea of large foundation, small town, um, it's I think another cause uh, for the perception of exceptionality, uh, but this aspect actually hasn't, um, uh, again, garnered much uh, attention. So, um, the town, uh, Divri, which I've marked here uh, for those who may not uh, know its uh, exact geographic location, um, located in what we might describe as East Central Anatolia. Um, and for much of the 12th and 13th centuries, uh, this region uh, was, and the city uh, was under the uh, control of a branch uh, of a regional dynasty known as the Mengujeket Principality. In terms of political history, the Divri branch of the Mengujeket seems to pale in comparison uh, to the other branch of the dynasty. Now, uh, the Mengujeket controlled this area, but they were uh, from at least the middle of the 12th century divided into a number of city-based uh, branches. So uh, the Divri branch uh, was clearly not as uh, important as the larger 
main city of this principality, uh, the city of Erzinjan, uh, further to the east. If it were not for the 12th and 13th century buildings with inscriptions in Divri, we would not even know that the Mengujekets held sway here because no contemporary source mentions uh, this branch. So ironically, the situation is the reverse for Erzinja, uh, about which there is reasonably decent textual information concerning its Mengujeket period but not a single example of medieval architecture survives here uh, due to the city's location on the North Anatolian fault line. Uh, and the, uh, as a result of uh, numerous devastating earthquakes uh, that have leveled the city since the medieval period. Now, um, according uh, to the inscription uh, on the uh, mosque of the mosque hospital complex, uh, the, it was, the mosque was founded by the Mengu jacket prince uh, named Ahmed Shah, uh, who is a direct descendant, and we might pass here, um, a direct descendant of the 12th century rulers uh, in Divri. The hospital, on the other hand, uh, bears an inscription naming a princess from the Erzinjan branch. So we have the two kind of branches coming together uh, in this uh, complex. Uh, the princess uh, named uh, Turan Melik uh, is often assumed to be Ahmed Shah's wife, uh, but this assumption actually cannot be confirmed. Um, it's one of the uh, one of the main kind of um, uh, romantic notions uh, that has sprung up around this uh, monument uh, that this was kind of a husband-wife uh, venture. Uh, they are related uh, by family, uh, but we don't know if they were, you know, they're kind of second cousins, uh, whether they were married is not something that any of the sources uh, tells us, nor the inscriptions. Okay. Now, um, just uh, to, again, briefly, uh, to look at uh, the plan, uh, um, what we have is, as I said, two discrete buildings. Uh, they are joined together. They share a single wall. So kind of show it. Here, here's the, uh, the wall. This is uh, the mosque here uh, on this side. So this is this wall is the, the Qibla wall of the mosque, uh, but it is also the wall uh, of the uh, hospital. So they share a wall between them, uh, but they are oriented uh, at 90 degrees to each other. So the mosque, uh, because of the Qibla direction, is oriented in this way, uh, whereas the hospital with its single entrance uh, is oriented, we might say, uh, in this way. The mosque plan is, in fact, very representative of a type that emerged in Anatolia in the first half of the 12th century, a longitudinal prayer hall described by uh, architectural historians as resembling very um, broadly speaking a basilica, uh, or what's referred to as basilica-like mosque or basilica-type mosque. Uh, the typical elements of such a mosque, as we have here uh, in Divri, is a kind of a north-south uh, axis from the main entrance to the mihrab uh, here. Uh, a very large dome in front of marking the area in front of the mihrab. And also uh, on the same axis, uh, an opening that you also see here actually in the section, uh, a central area, uh, which was open uh, to the sky. Um, now, there's, here's the main entrance. Uh, the mosque has two further entrances, uh, one on the western side uh, and a smaller one uh, on the eastern side, which in fact, uh, because it's on a higher level, it gives access to what used to be a gallery, uh, presumably reserved for the royal attendees. Um, so uh, it's, this entrance is not on the same level as these uh, two, um, the western and the north uh, entrance. Um, now, uh, as for the hospital, uh, the plan on the paper, as you can see it here <laughs> on paper, is uh, actually very much resembles a standard madrasa uh, of the 12th and 13th centuries, uh, with three, these uh, open, uh, what are called iwans, uh, two here symmetrically placed, and a main iwan uh, opposite the entrance, and then a number of symmetrically disposed rooms, 
uh, around this central courtyard, uh, which is covered, but like a little bit like the mosque, also has an opening uh, in the uh, center. Uh, and one last thing we might add is that the uh, medrasa also has uh, this corner room, uh, which was designated as a uh, burial area or a um, tomb chamber. One other thing I may just here at this point mention, uh, because I think this is quite uh, critical uh, for this building, is that it has a number of signatures. Um, there's a, a signature uh, in the mosque uh, on one of the um, arches uh, up top. They, they're very actually difficult to see, but they're there. Uh, and it names uh, uh, this individual, uh, Khurram Shah uh, Ibn Muiz El Khilati. Uh, there is an, another signature uh, on the east uh, entrance uh, naming a certain Ahmed Nakash, uh, again El Khilati. Uh, and then an, a third inscription um, with the name Khurram Shah El Khilati, which is so the, probably the same name as the one we have here on the mosque dome. And then the minbar uh, also has a, a signature uh, of a craftsman named Ahmed Ibn Ibrahim uh, at Tiflisi. So I, we don't, we have these names here. We don't have these names from any other uh, building, so we cannot uh, extend it much uh, further. Uh, but it is quite notable that three of those signatures, uh, which add, you know, add up to two individuals, uh, indicate a personal family quest, uh, connection uh, to Khilat, uh, or what is modern Ahlat, uh, further you know, southeast from Dibri uh, near uh, on uh, Lake Van. And just a, a, a quick view of the interior. I, we don't really have time to go over the whole complex. There's a lot to look at, <laughs> but uh, um, uh, the, in the time that we have, uh, we can't really do that. But I thought I'd just uh, sort of give you a view here uh, of the area of the mihrab, a very monumental, large mihrab with a very unusual um, design uh, and ornamentation uh, together with a, a quite a, a fine uh, minbar, uh, which is also signed and dated, dated a bit later actually than the mosque uh, to 1243. Um, and, uh, but it is a lot more standard in many ways in terms of its decoration uh, than the rest of the mosque. Okay, so uh, coming back to this uh, question of exceptionality, which brings us back out uh, to the two portals. As I said, there are four portals here, but it's really these two, um, uh, the north portal, the main portal of the mosque, uh, and then the portal of the hospital. Um, and how is, how is this, you know, this perception of exceptionality, how is this dealt with in the scholarly literature? There is, uh, we might say, a kind of a universal amazement at the plastic quality of the high relief carvings uh, on these portals, especially the north portal of the mosque uh, and the hospital portal. Uh, it's especially uh, the high relief vegetal motifs, uh, the disc shaped roundels uh, and the extravagant uh, looking uh, column capitals. Uh, so I'll just point them out, especially here on two sides. Uh, and here uh, on two sides uh, of the uh, hospital. So it's really these elements um, that are deemed exceptional in terms of their large scale treatment. It's not so much the motifs themselves, whether geometric or uh, vegetal, that are unique as such, but rather the density with which they are applied, uh, especially on the mosque north portal, as well as the combinations of these motifs and most especially their bold projection from the background. So these have been taken as something of a revolutionary landmark in the development of high relief portal decoration in Anatolia. The 20th century scholarship has put in some effort to pinpoint its origins and have employed the classic art historical method of compare and contrast. 
the results have not been satisfactory in terms of explaining the entirety of the complex's decorative program and architectural features. This was the conclusion reached, for example, by Michael Rogers, who in an article from 1969, examined points of similarity between Divri and a number of early 13th century Armenian churches located for the most part within the borders of uh, the Republic of Armenia. Despite offering a number of compelling comparisons between discrete elements uh, of decoration to test the degree of similarity uh, to Armenian and as well as Iranian uh, ornamentation, Rogers concluded that they, what he called the highly idiosyncratic application of ornament and masonry techniques on a monument like Divri ultimately made it impossible to sort out the question of the origin of style. The task is admittedly difficult and, and daunting and forces a kind of selectivity, which in turn is kind of difficult to justify uh, on an objective basis. So this is kind of the dilemma I think art historians uh, have faced. By the end of the 20th century, a common viewpoint on Divry's grammar of ornament held that it cannot be explained by recourse to a single local or regional artistic tradition. This viewpoint has been shared by a number of scholars, such as the architectural historian Yulmaz Önge, who in 1978 resolved the quandary by suggesting that the team of builders must have consisted of masters and artisans hailing from different cultural backgrounds. A similar position on the artistic resources behind the Divri portals has been held by the architectural historian Doan Kuban, who has produced two monographs uh, and a number of articles uh, on the subject. In his uh, 1997 uh, monograph, uh, which you see here, uh, the uh, cover, uh, which he um, wrote in Turkish, but there's also an English uh, translation of it. Uh, he rejected the possibility of a single artistic tradition that could explain the ornamentation of Divri. Instead, he claimed it as the lonely product of a process of complex engagement across time and space with significant latitude for improvisation or uh, what you might say, artistic license. This perception of the loneliness of the monument, the idea that there is nothing else like it, fed the notion of an artistic genius conceptualized as nothing less than a miracle. Indeed, the word miracle found itself in the title of this monograph. Kuban's miracle rests upon the claim of a multiplicity of sources of ornamental motifs combined independent of the boundaries of an established style but with unbounded enthusiasm on the part of its uh, creators. Like Önge, Kuban advanced the idea that only a team of master artisans hailing from a variety of backgrounds and coming together in, Divri, in the Divri project could explain the visual qualities of the ornamentation. In the last chapter of this monograph, Kuban made the argument that the ornamentation of the Divri complex in particular, its main portals should not be evaluated merely as a decorative program, but rather as sculptural art, different to, but on a par with the European tradition of sculpture. Kuban pursued this notion in his second monograph, uh, published in 2010, titled Gates of Paradise, the sculpture of Hurram Shah at Divri Ulujami and Shifahane, this oversized and profusely illustrated book emphasizes over and over again the idea that we should be perceiving here a sculptural program rather than a decorative or ornamental program subordinated to the exigencies of architectural forms. In addition to continuing this dichotomy between decoration and sculpture, in this book, uh, Doan Kuban also held up a particular interpretation of the North Portal of the mosque as a, quote, gate of paradise, hence uh, the title of the, the book. This idea was already actually present in the first book, but was carried to center stage in the second book and highlighted throughout. To quote from Kuban, 
The concept of paradise displayed on this door is based on the dominance of vegetal motifs in the architecture and the possible interpretation of its symbolic content. Both of these ideas, that is the overall sculptural qualities of the portals and the paradisiac symbolism of the North Portal were advanced as being entirely unique within the broader Islamic traditions. Although this paradisiac interpretation referenced primarily Islamic, especially Quranic sources, Kuban stated uh, somewhat paradoxically that the conception of a gate of paradise of such richness, and this is a quotation, direct quotation, the, co the conception of a gate of paradise of such richness is to be found nowhere in the history of Islamic art, whether in architecture, the art of the miniature, or literature, end of quote. Thus, once more, the Divri complex was cast into the lonely position of a unique and exceptional phenomenon. For Kuban, the exceptionality of Divri was such that he explicitly declared its stone carving to have, quote, no relation to any previous work, nor to any of a later period throughout the whole of Anatolian Turkish history, end of quote. It should be noted that although the exceptionality of Divri is well entrenched in the scholarship as a given, such a draconian version of it is not a universal opinion. We could cite, among others, the work of Semra Ögel, Michael Rogers, or Barbara Brand, who attributed the appearance of discrete high relief carving, uh, move here, um, uh, discrete high relief carving seen on some of the later 13th century architecture of Erzurum, Sivas, and Konya to be a possible reflection of the influence of Divri, so uh, Divri influencing later architecture. The idea of a connection between Divri and slightly later architecture has thus been entertained and debated, but surprisingly, or not surprisingly, not proven. And I think it's probably not really something that is provable. Much more common and accepted is the idea that Divri has no forerunners being presented strangely as a monument fed from deep roots, but having no peers in its own time or before. This particular conclusion is reached by recourse to an absence of evidence, a presumed fact that is then taken as evidence of absence. And this problem, uh, methodological problem, remains largely unacknowledged. The absence of evidence, however, is rather crucial to note and has two main aspects to it. Uh, for one, we need to take stock of the complete loss of any medieval architecture of Erzincan, uh, this uh, larger Mengücekit city to the east, which was, of course, the primary urban center of this dynasty. Moreover, the patron of the hospital, Turan Melik, was a member of the Erzincan branch of this dynasty. So the, I, the possibility of a forerunner of some type in Erzincan can be conjectured but of course, without any evidence, this is something of a dead end. Secondly, the artist's signatures in the complex are conspicuous for the connection they indicate to the city of Ahlat. Not only the two signatures of Khurram Shah, but also the signature of Ahmed on the Eastern entrance connect these masters to Ahlat. I have argued uh, previously, though I think not in sufficient detail, that the Ahlat connection needs to be taken into account. The reason it tends to be ignored has to do with the fact that there are no surviving buildings in Ahlat that could be dated to a period before the second half of the 13th century. There are, however, a large number of tombstones with a degree of sophistication that are arguably on a par uh, with the work at Divri in terms of design and execution. It is also worth noting that some 30 years before the construction of the mosque hospital complex, um, a, tomb, uh, a tomb tower built for an earlier Mengücekid ruler of Divri was also signed by an artist with a background in Ahlat. So the Ahlat connection should not be dismissed off the cuff although admittedly bridging the gap in scale and function 
between an architectural monument, such as uh, this complex, and this series of tombstones, of which you see one example on the right, is a challenging task at best. Still Ahlat, at least, is, I think, not quite a dead end uh, and warrants some looking and thinking. So this is a very brief summary of what I think uh, should actually be a larger debate on the implications of perceptions of exceptionality. Uh, personally, I don't think that we need to refute that this double monument is exceptional in a number of ways. But I think we do need to take this exceptionalism uh, as a reminder of the limitations of our state of knowledge and perhaps also our imagination. So I'm going to wrap up uh, here this very uh, hopefully brief uh, presentation so I don't take up more time uh, from the questions of our moderator uh, and of our uh, attendees. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Oya, and I'd like, also like to thank uh, Anamed um, uh, for uh, inviting me to uh, to be a part of uh, tonight. Um, uh, this is, uh, I mean, working with Oya is always a pleasure, and also discussing Diri is uh, is particularly uh, very exciting. So, um, I mean, I have a, a few questions uh, now. Uh, maybe Can the, the first one. Sharing my screen, do you think, or? Should I keep it up? Um, I mean, in, in case we want to refer back to it, but maybe for the for the discussion for the Soviet, I don't know um, if our audience might. Uh, I mean, prefer without. Uh, let's keep it on for a while. <laughs> see if okay, we let's see. Let's see. Um, we okay. may need to refer back to it. Um, well, first of all, the, the, the first question I wanted to ask is um, about how you ended. Uh, last week, in one of my classes, uh, we were discussing how it is, how important it is to experience architecture. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, it's also quite difficult and, of course, in the COVID situation, almost impossible to, to see every single building in our, in our fields. Uh, I mean, imagine trying to see uh, to, to visit every single um, Ottoman mosque to write about Ottoman architecture. Um, and then one of my students asked, Hojam, but what if we didn't have Divri? Uh, and so let me ask you, what is it about this, this one building? Yeah, uh, <laughs> if we didn't have Divri, uh, well, our, our lives will be, would be uh, easier, but not better. <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, yeah, I think it, it's uh, by having Divri, right? So, or not having Divri. I mean, we also should, maybe this question forces us to think about something I tried to point out in, in my presentation, but, you know, if you don't have certain things, like let's say you don't have any medieval architecture from Erzincan, <laughs> which you know to have been a major center, you know, what do you do with that, right? So um, uh, in the case of Divri, if we didn't have this monument or any of the other monuments, uh, supposedly lesser monuments uh, in the city, which are, uh, you know, another mosque uh, and a number of uh, tomb towers, uh, then actually in, in this case, we wouldn't even know that, you know, this city, this town was uh, ruled. By, so we wouldn't even have a chapter of political history. Um, which tells us, you know, how much we would not know, uh, and therefore how much we actually don't know. I, it, I think it forces us to take um, stock of the the magnitude of the kind of these big holes uh, in our knowledge, such as Erzincan. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but it's there, <laughs> and, and, and so uh, it's a building that um, certainly, I, I think, does elicit a lot of uh, personal reactions. Uh, some of the, I, you know, I wasn't able to uh, touch on every kind of study that has been done on uh, Divri. Some of the studies have been very technical, 
which are quite interesting, actually. I recently came across uh, um, some uh, work uh, that I didn't know uh, on the vaulting uh, systems uh, and the attempt to reconstruct these. Uh, it's, it's quite actually uh, humbling to see the amount of technical information that is also, you know, can be um, garnered from, uh, from studying this building. Um, uh, and, you know, as I said, I haven't touched on everything, so I haven't touched on other kind of uh, uh, studies that have gone into uh, attempting to interpret uh, what the, the meaning uh, of these portals or uh, other aspects of the building uh, may have been. Um, so it's, it's it, when you look at all of these different kinds of studies, you tend, I tend to note a kind of a personal feeling that seems to come to the fore and it's something that you know is um the the impact or, or the effect of the building i think mm -hmm. on the visitor or the viewer um so yeah that's also a reality that uh whenever we deal with a building whether it's exceptional or unexceptional um you know our the degree of our personal reaction to it also tends to differ so you know it always puts us in a kind of a shifting ground. Uh, we don't approach every building in the same way. Um, so um, I think what, you know, this kind of having an exceptional building, have, knowing that it's, you know, there and it forces us to reckon with it. Uh, and I do actually appreciate uh, all various efforts. Uh, I, you know, I may sound critical, <laughs> but actually my criticism is not so much at the different ways of interpreting it or trying to understand it, but rather the kind of the lack of a debate on what this exceptionality implies. Uh, how do we take stock of our lack of knowledge, the absence of evidence? How do we kind of compute all of that into a, you know, a kind of a, a re reconstruction of this building? Uh, in our modern terms. Um, maybe as a follow-up question, I think one of the aspects of the building that really e kind of evokes, um, you know, the visitors' emotions is the, is the ornament. Uh, so uh, that, you mentioned the idea of, you know, decoration versus sculpture um, uh, in architecture. Could you open this up a little further, perhaps? Um. Yeah, I mean, this idea is, I think, most prominent uh, it, it, with regard to Divri uh, in the work of Doan Kuban. Um, and it, of course, it comes from looking at the, uh, the kind of the entirety of the surviving record of architectural decoration uh, in a given place and period, like medieval Anatolia and Islamic architecture within uh, medieval Anatolia. And uh, um, so I guess the idea is that, you know, for the most part, uh, this decoration is, you know, it's kind of surface decoration um, in, a, uh, in a way that is kind of identified as typical or uh, quintessentially Islamic. Yeah, the, and recently, of course, there's more uh, kind of studies and debates on Islamic ornamentation and what ornament means. Yeah, um, but I think going back one or two or three generations, well, at least two generations, um, I think maybe people, you know, some scholars carry a kind of a baggage here uh, that uh, uh, is this kind of dichotomy between, you know, European Western art on the one hand, uh, in which sculpture has a prominent role um, but uh, the Islamic um, artistic traditions uh, don't, right? That's a kind of <laughs> accepted as a given. Uh, and so it's, I, I think it's a, a, an impulse to correct a perception of a dichotomy um, by saying, but yes, but there, you know, this is sculptural. Uh, sculptural in the sense that it's almost, it is three-dimensional, it very much projects from its background, uh, and therefore it can be compared or put on the same 
um, level of artistic um, venture, let's say, I don't want to say accomplishment, uh, but venture as what you might find in a medieval European um, uh, church in terms of decoration, etc. So, um, but I think there another problem arises because then, you know, this kind of, you know, I come back to this problem of exceptionality. Um, so it's, it, it kind of, you know, once we, if we accept, I mean, I, we cannot deny that there's a lot of kind of sculptural qualities, uh, but if we want, if we put this in a kind of a dichotomy, East versus West or Europe versus Islamic part, uh, then I think we um, uh, kind of see and end up seeing this building once more as something of an anomaly. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, something can be unusual, but it's maybe not as anomalous as, as we would imagine. Yeah. Um, another question uh, I, I had was about the, the gate of paradise and the kind of Quranic uh, imagery. I mean, perhaps you could elaborate on, on your ideas uh, or your response to that a, a little bit. Um, that, that's also related to what we've been discussing as well. Yeah, this uh, it's a it's an interpretation of of especially this what you see here uh, on the left, the north portal, um, and uh, it's the idea that Doan Kuban advanced uh, in both of his books, but especially the second one, um, and he. He does this uh, kind of reading, uh, Gate of Paradise reading, with reference especially to uh, Qur'an's, uh, Quranic descriptions um, of, uh, uh, of paradise, but not only Quranic descriptions. So, but then he, he tends to focus you know, on uh, mentions of you know, kind of lush vegetation, and it's true, uh, the, veget the, the decoration here is quite lush. Um, another element uh, that he points out that you can't really see it that well on this uh, photograph, uh, but up here uh, there is a lot uh, what is described as a lotus ornament, uh, which is uh, another uh, specific plant type, I guess, um, referred to, uh, in descriptions of Islamic paradise. Um, and then he combines that with uh, by looking at uh, the decoration here extending vertically on two sides of the entrance uh, um, and uh, sees it as a kind of a, um, an ascent, an ascension uh, in nine levels, uh, which he then connects to some uh, um, Turkic symbolism of, you know, uh, ascending uh, to the heavens. So it, actually what he does is he combines Islamic notions of uh, descriptions uh, or descriptive elements of paradise uh, with uh, a kind of a generic Turkic, um, or maybe not generic, but uh, I mean, not a very well defined, I should say, uh, Turkic idea. Uh, not, I mean, not well defined in terms of its, you know, context, time period. Uh, of this, you know, you know, this rise to the heavens, uh, etc. So, but he puts these three things together, together with the lotus, um, uh, to say that well, this might, this must resemble, uh, or must have resembled to the viewer uh, the idea of paradise. Uh, and because it's a gate, you know, that he says. I mean, he you know, obviously, he I think wouldn't claim to have proven this, but I think he. Uh, wants to make a convincing argument about about it. Um, not everyone, I think, has. I mean, people haven't engaged too much with each other's <laughs> interpretations and arguments, and uh, that's uh, another impression one gets when you uh, kind of scan the literature: is that uh, people uh, tend to go off in different directions. Um, so, uh, a more recent uh, study by Ali Uzay Pekar. Um, actually, he specifically rejects this uh, paradisiac interpretation um, and suggests that it's uh, there are you know more complex cosmological symbols uh, here, a kind of a, a representation of um, uh, the you know these cosmological symbols that uh, amount to an idea of a threshold of passing from kind of this world. 
uh, to the beyond, not necessarily beyond being paradise, uh, but kind of the limits of the known world. Uh, so he advances that by, I mean, rejects the idea of paradise, uh, but brings a different cosmological reading. Um, so, I mean, then there are, there's a more recent um, book published by Erdal Eser, um, who's actually uh, worked in Divri, especially on the Citadel. Uh, he's the, uh, uh, the director of the excavations in the Citadel. Uh, he recently published a book, uh, it's kind of like a series of essays, uh, and uh, he uh, actually uh, looks, I think, tries to look more holistically at this building. Um, but then his interpretation is on a more romantic level, uh, suggesting, you know, being informed by the, 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 the kind of the husband and wife um, model <laughs> of the patronage here. Uh, so the, the interpretations, I mean, they, they tend to go off and have a life of their own. Uh, that's my feeling. Um, and the, what I think they have in common, whether it's the paradisiac interpretation or another one, is uh, uh, that, uh, that it, it's kind of enabled by taking this exceptionalism as a given without interrogating its implications. That's um, what I would say. Otherwise, I think all of the interpretations are you know quite interesting but how do we get there i guess is where i kind of would stop and uh, ponder <laughs> yes i mean it's interesting and also given the kind of lack of historical context uh, i mean more i think debate uh, and discussion um of these would be useful probably Mm -hmm. um, something I, I, else that I wanted to kind of return to uh, that you mentioned is this uh, paradox in, in Divri that we have, uh, you know, the small city with an oversized uh, monument. Uh, do you have any further comments uh, about this? Yeah, I mean, you know, why, I guess, is what we would ask. I mean, why, why do they feel the need uh, to build uh, this double institution, a mosque and a hospital, specifically a hospital? Um, and the tomb. I mean, the tomb is also. Right, with a tomb. Actually, there is uh, nearby the remains of a bathhouse. Uh, there's mm -hmm. some debate whether it was part of this complex or not. So it, it might have been, or it might have been slightly later. Um, so, and also the question is previous to this construction. Uh, was the city confined uh, to the citadel or maybe you know the citadel and just its outskirts immediate uh, outskirts or uh, you know what was this part of the town uh, what we have in the lower town actually uh, we have some large cemeteries but also a number of tomb towers so it's it seems like it this is this project was a uh, attempt to kind of break out <laughs> the urban context from the citadel um, which already had its you know uh, Friday mosque uh, which was probably uh, sufficient uh, as a as a prayer space because it's not tiny you know uh, it's a good size uh, prayer hall uh, but this is probably a conscious attempt to kind of break out and create maybe start creating a kind of a more expanded expansive urban context for this town so it might be i mean the timing is interesting uh, 12 20 29 um, it's interesting for two reasons one is it's actually exactly in that year that the Erzinjan branch, branch of the dynasty is, I mean, the Erzinjan and it's the region is annexed uh, by uh, the Seljuk uh, dynasty. Um, so, uh, and that branch of the family is sent into exile, etc. And we know that the, um, Turan Melik is uh, a member of that branch of the family. So uh, all of this is happening politically. Uh, it, it's a major blow <laughs> to this uh, dynasty and its image. Very interestingly, clearly, uh, both this monument and some later inscriptions, uh, especially on the citadel, show us that this Divri branch persisted here. That is, they probably became or were already vassals and continued as such of the Seljuks, but they remained in place. 
So whatever made that possible for them to stay put, <laughs> uh, you know, acknowledging uh, this the, the the power of the the Seljuks and basically you know being allowed to stay put is something that maybe something they I don't want to say celebrated but kind of put into a more concrete form by saying you know so the Erzincan branches no more <laughs> uh, here we, we are <laughs> here we are um, so that's I mean it, it's a, a, a the historical um, uh, kind of uh, conjunction here is I think interesting. It's also interesting because exactly in that same year from 1227 to 29, I guess uh, we have uh, it's actually in Erzincan, a very famous physician of his period, uh, and Abdul um, Latif El Baghdadi is uh, before the end of the Erzincan branch uh, is invited and he comes to Erzincan. Uh, he spends quite a bit of time there. But uh, ultimately, and he does travel in the area. He has a kind of autobiography without sufficient detail, unfortunately. But he does mention that in 1228 29, he was actually on the move in this region and did pass through places like Kemah and Divri. Oh, so uh, perhaps, and given also what's happening politically, maybe this was an attempt uh, also to keep this very well known physician in this area by offering him a, a hospital. <laughs> yes, <Yeah, yeah>, so <laughs> <post. laughs> practice his uh, profession. I mean, that's just a speculation, but I think the, it's interesting uh, that this uh, 12, 20, 29 is the, the year that all of these things are uh, happening. Yes, I mean, the historical context, I mean, the dating and, and, and of course, I mean, these buildings were populated, so so to think about you know who who was uh, who was uh, appointed here, etc., is, is fascinating. Um, my last question, I realize that we will uh, need to move on to the Q and A soon, uh, is about Ahlat. Uh, and um, I mean, you and I had a, a chance to visit Ahlat together, which was very memorable. And uh, uh, perhaps we can also shout out to uh, Dr. Peter Liu. He might be in the uh, audience uh, today. He was traveling with us. Um, I know that uh, you and I could say maybe we were disappointed not to find earlier material uh, in, in Ahlat. But why is it that Ahlat is still exciting and uh, important for us? Um. I think it's also exceptional. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yes, there's that. I mean, really, there is no other uh, town that has preserved such an extensive uh, funerary record, and so that's important. Uh, I mean, putting aside the artistic element, but you know, from a standpoint of you know, uh, prosopography, uh, especially, you know, what who are these people? <laughs> uh, there are li literally uh, thousands. Of tombstones uh, in in Ahlat uh, dating from the end of the 12th century, uh, not too many from that period, but still you can trace it from that period, actually from the middle of the 12th century, um, all the way uh, to the 15th, 16th century. So you get a long, a kind of a long durée. Uh, of artistic production, um, you see, can follow changes. Uh, you can follow. They're also signed. Um, of course, none of these signatures match any of the signatures we have in Ahlat, so you, in Divri. Uh, but we have a lot of signatures, and we can uh, see a kind of a uh, a network of um, craftsmanship of um, master apprentice relationships. Um, and then, you know, uh, moving from that uh, kind of there's the social artistic context to the actual, you know, the production uh, end of it and looking at, you know, uh, analyzing um, decoration on these tombstones combined with uh, inscriptions. Uh, I think, uh, you know, the example that I just pulled here, and this is, uh, uh, to be fair, this is uh, not a 13th, but I believe a 14th century example uh, of a tombstone from Ahlat. Uh, but uh, you can see how, uh, you know, a similar way of stacking images or, or of motifs, I should say, uh, on top of each other, uh, the same kind of concept uh, is also present uh, here. So I think it's, it's really the, 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 extent, the great extent 
of the available material uh, in Ahlat uh, in terms of these tombstones. Um, uh, that I think make it very clear that there is a very vibrant um, artistic uh, activity in this city. Uh, again, why we don't have the architecture <laughs> preserved except for um, you know, standing monuments, at least uh, from the late uh, 13th century uh, onwards. Um, again, I think it can be explained partly by earthquakes, but in Ahlat's case, also partly by a series of uh, assaults on the city from the 13th century to the 16th century. So um, that kind of explains, you know, so that's a big challenge there. Uh, <laughs> but I think the, it's not that we have, you know, 20, 30, 50 tombstones, there are literally thousands of them. So uh, I think it's, it's uh, just as uh, daunting as the density of decoration at Livry. Uh, but the, it's uh, material to be, you know, sifted through and reckoned with. Uh, ultimately, uh, it will take several generations, I think. Uh, but um, yeah, I would say just it's really the richness of it uh, that I think, um, you know, requires us to put it into the Divri equation, whatever equation we set up for Divri. Uh, one of the uh, elements of that equation needs to be Ahlat, I think. Thank you, Oya. I'm uh, now looking at the, the, the Q&A uh, questions and uh, uh, Nas has uh, very kindly uh, kind of made a collation and we have a lot of questions. So I don't know if we can go through all of them. Maybe, Oya, I don't know if, you, if you're quick. <laughs> uh, quick, quick, answer. <laughs> quick answers. Uh, so from Elizabeth Foden, um, are there travelers from whatever tradition who mentioned the complex at Divri? Do they uh, perhaps compare it to other buildings? Um. I think the earliest we have is Evliya Celebi. Yeah, um, that's uh, 17th century. You know, in typical Evliya fashion, he <laughs> says there's nothing else like it, but he says that for other places as well. So he, 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 he brings exceptionalism to a lot of places he goes to. Um, he, yeah, he, he, his description of it is interesting, uh, but it is, a, of course, a, a, a late description. So it's a late perception of the monument. And then, of course, you have uh, a number of 19th century uh, visitors. Um, I can't remember anything in between those. But they, right. they, they don't, I think they're too late to add anything to the question of the, you know, mm -hmm. what's going on here. <laughs> So uh, another question by uh, Suzanne Oniz is, uh, was there some kind of waterway decorative or therapy related in the hospital? How does rainwater enter the, the hospital? Very more technical. Uh, was uh, the water was, is that the question? The water was a- uh... The waterway, like there's, there's a question related to mm. like therapy um, uh, and then the technical aspect of how, yeah. how would the rainwater be collected? Uh, yeah, I think actually the monument, uh, I mean, they, they're both the hospital and the, the mosque are at, right now, are for the last uh, few to several years, uh, is undergoing a major restoration. Uh, and they're, I think, looking into some of these questions of, uh, you know, what was underneath those uh, openings to the sky, both on the mosque, but also in the hospital. Um, if I'm not wrong, the uh, there is a pool underneath the opening of the hospital in the mm -hmm. central courtyard. Uh, but I believe that was that they there may have originally been there a, a pool there, but I think that pool that we see today is a, a part of a 20th century uh, renovation project. Um, so uh, one needs to be careful when looking yes. at, you know, because it, the building has already gone through a number of restoration phases. The other thing I should quickly add is we know from a um, number of um, Ottoman period records, uh, tax registers actually, uh, that kind of reflect some earlier history of this building uh, that we understand that by the mid 14th century, the hospital was no longer functioning as a hospital. It was functioning as a madrasa, a kind of a, a law school. 
Um, so uh, it, uh, it you know, the human resources, professional resources required to make it function as a hospital may have not been able to be maintained in the city mm -hmm. for very long. So oh, it's hard to say much about its, uh, you know, ther therapy aspect. Uh, well, there are a number of questions on um, uh, on uh, workmen and their identity. So, um, uh, so one, uh, Ur Özkan asks, uh, did Yilmaz Öngi or Doğan Do Kuban present any information regarding the identity or background of the team of builders? If so, uh, through what kind of sources? And then um, uh, another person asks, um, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this correctly, are there any non-Muslim workers in construction of this building? I've heard that the Armenians were talented in, in, in stone carving. And then there's a, another question. The tombstone on the photo reminds me that um, Armenian Hachkars, the carved uh, stone crosses. Could you make a comment about that? Thank you. And this is by uh, Thomas Tarzian. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think uh, um, I just in the presentation, I very briefly mentioned that Michael Rogers was one of the um, scholars who kind of uh, did uh, uh, a, a kind of an attempt to kind of correlate some of the decoration uh, with uh, decoration found on some uh, Armenian architecture uh, of the you know 13th century, especially. Um, and uh, actually, there are very compelling, and not only in his comparisons, but if one extends that uh, very compelling similarities, not only in the decoration, but also in the, which you know, I haven't shown in this presentation, the, the form of the columns in the interior, uh, the handling of some of the capitals, etc. So it shows uh, certainly a kind of a connection to a broader um, architectural tradition and decorative tradition uh of of armenian uh um of the armenian realms yeah um so uh that's quite clear and then you know the names of the art the that i've signed here um themselves uh i are seem to be names of muslim craftsmen i mean ahmed and uh, Huram Shah, uh, his name itself doesn't say anything to us, uh, but his father's name is uh, Muris, so that's an Arabic name, so that suggests to us that he must be a Muslim craftsman, but uh, let, if we if we understand that they're all from Ahlat, and um, son Ahlat uh, had uh, uh, kind of, of course, a continuity of uh, Armenian um, uh, you know, background uh, and, and continuation of that identity uh, throughout this period. Uh, and, you know, combine that with the last question you asked there, uh, the similarity between, uh, the, especially formal similarities between these tombstones and hachkars uh, is, I think uh, some scholars have already pointed this out. Um, so yes, I think, uh, um, the, the conclusion that Michael Rogers came to in his comparison with Armenian architecture was that that Divri is too idiosyncratic <laughs> to be only ex only I don't know to be explained uh, by a, a reference to Armenian architecture. Um, so this is where the problem comes because uh, you know you, scholars have kind of given up <laughs> on trying to correlate this building. Uh, and there's, there comes a point when they kind of stop doing that and then to kind of turn inwards to say, this is very exceptional and unique. Uh, but I think these uh, lines of inquiry can be pushed further, uh, more compelling comparisons can be made and maybe some more can be said on this. And, uh, but by the names alone, yeah, we just assume they're from Ahlat, by definition, uh, they are coming from a background that is overlapping of Islamic and Armenian traditions, uh, very strong Armenian traditions there. Uh, thank you, Oya. So there are a number of questions about uh, ornaments and uh, symbols and, and so on. Uh, so um, Feza Günergün asks, are there medical symbols on the portal of the hospital? Uh, and Peyton Kalafatola asks, I'm wondering how you interpret the human heads in the orna ornamentation regarding the idea of exceptionality. Um, Suzanne Uniz asks, what is your favorite motif <laughs> in the debris complex? Um, 
Uh, Khan Okrar asks, can you say more about sculptural versus ornamental? What evidence do we have and what difference does it make? So there are lots of questions. Uh, it continues <laughs> yeah. about, um, I mean, I, as you can imagine, because uh, uh, as we said, they're so evocative, uh, but uh, the, the medical symbols perhaps to start yeah, off with, and uh, there was a question the, about like the plant motifs. Okay. Uh, um, actually, just uh, the uh, hospital portal, uh, this is what uh, the question, I guess the second question you mentioned uh, refers to. Um, there, there are or were uh, two elements here on this side and symmetrically on this side, um, each of which was uh, representing a human head. Uh, the one on the right, uh, both of them actually, their faces have been obliterated, uh, that's damaged, uh, deliberately damaged. Uh, we don't know exactly when that happened. Um, hard to know. Uh, but uh, so, uh, yeah, are these medical uh, symbols? Uh, yeah, maybe something can be extended uh, from some kind of medical symbolism to, you know, take us into this kind of figural realm. Uh, but, you know, how we do that is not quite uh, evident. Um, and also, you know, it seems quite and I mean, yes, this portal is very exceptional as a whole, and a number of its uh, decoration elements are very exceptional. Um, but it's um, the, the human heads uh, we have other examples of. So uh, just a few years earlier uh, in Nide, uh, one of the entrance portals to the mosque, the so-called Alaaddin Mosque, has two human heads uh, carved on it uh, above the entrance, uh, which is more kind of radical <laughs> compared to having them on a hospital portal. Um, so, and then we also have them uh, in um, Sivas and the 1217, uh, again, hospital uh, in Sivas. Uh, they're not, not on the portal, but on the inside, on either side of the, the main Avon. Uh, and uh, they also have inscriptions. So uh, one is represented as a moon figure, the other is as a sun figure. Um, and the ref the, um, uh, they're inscribed with the reference to the, the, the confession of faith, you know, there is no God but God, and Muhammad is his messenger. So uh, there, I mean, they're also in a hospital. So is that a medical symbolism or is it something about, you know, uh, kind of uh, celestial symbolism uh, and referring that to the relationship between Muhammad and God? So. It's, uh, <laughs> we don't have too many examples, but we have these examples. Um, um, what so was... I guess there's another question. Is there, do you see a program um, uh, with, uh, with the kind, of, is there an ornamental program, I guess? Um, a... Across a... the portals. Um... Across the portals. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, maybe, but I'm not sure that it's across all of the portals. Um, and also, the, I didn't go into this, but there is a question about the, not these two portals, but the, let's go back, um, the Western, uh, uh, the Western portal. Uh, there is a debate on whether um, this is uh, original uh, to the, we know this side of the mosque actually had structural problems, uh, both on the interior and on this uh, Western facade. So uh, whether this is uh, original or it's a later uh, reconstruction, uh, it's hard to know. Um, but uh, if there's a program, <laughs> uh, it, it should be between uh, the mosque's north portal at least uh, and the hospital portal, because then the other, the east portal, the kind of the royal entrance uh, is something that is quite different and much more um, standard actually. So it doesn't fit into the mold of exceptionalism uh, and it uh, kind of stands out. So this is another aspect of this mosque that uh, once you go off on the exceptionalism uh, discourse, uh, this portal tends to be forgotten a little bit <laughs> because it doesn't work that well. Um, so yeah, uh, there's a question of what's my favorite motif. <laughs> I think I have to say I love these uh, column capitals, these exaggerated column capitals, especially here. Uh, it doesn't even have a column as such, but it's a capital. <laughs> I think those are great. Um, and then the question about sculpture versus decoration. Yeah, this is a big 
can of worms. <laughs> um, yeah, I, to me, it doesn't matter, actually. I mean, I can just say it's sculptural um, decoration. <laughs> Uh, because I don't attach uh, kind of too much value to these personally, but other scholars do. So, um, and they tend to want to kind of deal with that. And so uh, it's a matter of, I think, uh, perspective and the perspective, the, kind of the baggage that one brings to it. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Thank you. So uh, the next question, uh, I, I'm trying to <laughs> go through them, as you can see. Uh, so, uh, uh, Lucien uh, uh, Jacques, uh, Divry, as you know, has been characterized by stylistic isolation. Uh, could you speak a bit about what other types of networks it was embedded into in terms of factors like trade routes, medical practices of the time and region, women's patronage, and quarry locations? Yeah. Um... Uh, well, I think, you know, it's a small town, but it was on a, a kind of a route, uh, especially a north-south route that uh, connects uh, uh, this region further south to uh, Harput, uh, this kind of road that leads south to Harput, and then, of course, from there to Diyarbakir and beyond uh, to, the, uh, to northern Mesopotamia. So I think in that sense, it was definitely probably part of a network. Of course, it's um, part of an east-west network as well, but uh, as an east-west uh, kind of direction of movement, it was probably not on the main route there uh, between, let's say, Sivas and Arzinjan and Arzuro, a little bit off the, the main path, but still, you know, in, not that far from it. So, and uh, Divri, I mean, those who know Divri, modern Divri, you know that uh, one of the first things that comes to people's mind in Turkey, that it's... Uh, a place with a major uh, iron um, iron mine. Um, it, probably this is not just a modern <laughs> uh, uh, resource. Uh, we know that uh, iron mining goes back uh, to the uh, even to the hit. I mean, even to the Bronze Age, <laughs> as it were, kind of an overlap between the Bronze Age and the Iron Age. Um, so uh, it's quite possible that the resources of patronage here have to do with that uh, iron, you know, uh, deposits uh, in the area. Um, and that's a kind of an economic uh, network or explanation. Um, in terms of women's patronage, yeah, it, it's uh, period-wise and region-wise, yeah, it's <laughs> quite rich in that. Um, uh, we have a much er a, a quite a bit earlier uh, example in uh, Mama Hatun, uh, who built uh, a, a large foundation uh, in a very small place, <laughs> uh, Tarjan, uh, between Erzurum and Erzincan. Um, but, uh, you know, you have dots, let's say, uh, of women's patronage, uh, but uh, to connect them into a pattern is something that I think we haven't done yet. Um, I was thinking of uh, Gevher Nisibe is interesting too. Uh, um, yes, in Kayseri. Yeah, yes, Kayseri is a, comparison. Also a number of uh, examples of uh, women's patronage. Um, so it's interesting the difference between these urban contexts. You know, Kayseri has its own quirks, <laughs> as it were, and also patronage wise, it has its characteristics. And I think women figure highly there uh, as compared to a place like I would say Sivas as, as mm -hmm. far as we know <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and then when you go to these smaller places like Divri and, and uh, Tarjan and a number of other places across Anatolia you find of course uh, examples of women's patronage but uh, I'm not sure I, you know if we can um, extract a pattern from it uh, Perhaps we can. I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, interesting that, like in in um, in Kayseri, uh, it's brother and sister. Um, so your your uh, you know um, questioning of the relationship in Diri, I think, is is interesting. You know that there's this assumption that they're husband and wife, but they may not necessarily be uh, be so. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they may just be cousins. <laughs> um, but also the idea of a double patronage you know mm -hmm. uh, this is something that I think again maybe it's uh, the model of Kayseri was one that uh, kind of spread across the country and was picked up here uh, in, in this place you know 
I mean, these two buildings could have been separate. Was it just that it was they shared a wall, so it's if <laughs> faster to build? I'm not sure um, that they just wanted to put them together. We don't understand why. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in, in the in the tombs. Um, but to continue with the, with the questions, uh, Sunacha Aptai asks, uh, going back to Oya's remarks on the vaulting, some of the vaulting details at Divri shows up in a variety of Seljuk buildings, Hans, Medreses, and etc., and the Ottoman and Aydinid mosques. Yet we can't seem to uh, get the same style of carving later on. Why does this happen? A departure from the Mengujig's aesthetic taste and identity? Do sculptural carvings serve a different purpose in the artistic context, uh, one that is different from uh, the art of construction? Actually, you know, there is an um, interesting art, uh, article um, in this 1978 volume on Divri. This is a, a kind of a standard volume. Uh, most, um, on just, it was published by the uh, Vakuf Lagen. This, this one, right? That one, yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, there's an article in there by um, Aishil Tukalia who's uh, on the vaults. Uh, vault and specifically focusing on the vaulting above the royal gallery uh, in the corner there. Um, and she comes, I mean, she doesn't discuss it too much, but she makes a very interesting uh, observation that she thinks that there might be a kind of a connection here uh, between uh, the complexity, the geometric complexity of the vaulting, especially in that corner of the house of the mosque, and um, tile decoration. Um, so I thought that was an interesting idea to pursue uh, because, of course, this building doesn't have any, as far as we know, <laughs> tile decoration. Um, so it was this kind of um, stonework, this masonry, uh, very sophisticated. Actually, the vaulting systems are very sophisticated. But was it aesthetically relating to another medium? I, I think it's an interesting question. Uh, but then, you know, on the other side, yes, it's the, the technical sophistication and knowledge is something that clearly shows a huge amount of experience and knowledge uh, that is really uh, humbling. So um, it, it tends to, yeah, this is something that you know, I haven't studied too much in detail, but from the studies I've seen, it, it, this is where maybe the real exceptionality of the re maybe should be attributed. Uh, in, in technical aspect, uh, as opposed to so much the the decorative elements. I mean, and that's how the technical elements become very decorative too, but <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm trying to kind of go through the, some of the questions uh, overlap, but um, uh, so perhaps as a follow-up, Zeynep uh, Inan Ojak, we can see the unfinished ornament at Double Minarets or Orshki Church in Erzurum. Like Divri, these monuments are also important in large scale structures. In this context, do you have any opinion about the ornament uh, process? Did you have uh, any unfinished ornaments or do you think it was completed during the construction? Um, yeah, no, uh, there are uh, areas where uh, uh, we, the, the state of in completeness is uh, evident, especially on the hospital portal. So the carving, especially in this area, um, uh, was not completed. Uh, so this is the uh, low relief carving that was not completed. So that actually gives us a, a, a understanding of, uh, you know, the, the process of, <laughs> you know, how they proceeded <laughs> uh, between high relief and low relief. And it seems the low relief carving was uh, left to the last, and maybe in this case, we clearly in this case, it was not uh, completed. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, the, clearly, I, the, the, first of all, the signatures in this building, including the Minberg inscription, which uh, names an artist uh, with a background in, uh, in Tiflis or Tbilisi, uh, which he may not be a first generation, but anyway, uh, some kind of family connection. Um, this suggests that this, if we connect this building anywhere, we're going to connect it further east. Um, we may not connect it 100%, but I think all uh, examples of um, earlier architecture with prominent stone decoration, uh, that would be mainly Armenian and Georgian architecture, 
uh, like the one that was just mentioned, um, is relevant. Um, but I think, you know, the most meaningful comparisons will come from buildings that are closer in time rather than, you know, I don't know how relevant a 10th century building would be or an 11th century building would be, but certainly another 13th century building is quite relevant. Um, okay, so uh, another question by Eric Brug. Um, so he has two questions. If we see Divri as an outlier and if Arzinjan architecture might have been close to Divri architecture, is it likely that all, most or most, uh, Mengujegid architecture would have been um, such an outlier relative to other Anatolian architecture? And then two, Divri to me is about exuberance, ex extravagance achieved by artistic license. But this artistic license must have been authorized by the patrons, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, the first question about the being an outlier. Um, well, I mean, what do we know? We actually, you know, we don't know anything about Arzinjan, but uh, we have another town, uh, Kemah, uh, and we have uh, the remains of a 13th, uh, sorry, 12th, uh, late 12th century. Uh, tomb tower, uh, which is very, uh, I mean, it's uh, quite connectable uh, to uh, uh, architecture, uh, brick architecture, because it's uh, made in brick, <laughs> uh, from uh, northwestern Iran and Azerbaijan uh, of the 12th century. So very connectable. So uh, Arzinjan might have had, I would assume, also some brick architecture uh, relatable to uh, you know, the architecture of North 12th century Azerbaijan and Northwestern Iran. Uh, but I would also assume that it should have had some stone architecture. Um, yeah. Um, yes, I, th I think uh, the uh, patrons who, the, I mean, we cannot know if the patrons asked for this <laughs> or simply agreed to it. <laughs> Um, I think that's uh, something that uh, each one of us will have to kind of uh, feel out on our own. Um, yeah, I, you know, there's there's something interesting that the, this East Portal is not a, a extravagant. <laughs> I have to say it. That, so, and that's that's the royal entrance. It's much more standard from a 13th century perspective with its more standard mukarnas, etc., and low relief carving. Um, so there is a kind of a distinction that they were clearly looking out for, that these main entrances should be different, but the uh, restricted entrance should be more typical. But what conclusion we can draw from that uh, regarding the patron's you know, attitude, or uh, I'm not sure. Um, we have we have some comments, but I, I feel like we should also um, wrap up. Uh, it's almost uh, eight o'clock. Uh, there are other interesting questions and comments. So maybe uh, uh, one more question uh, about your interpretation of the competition, perhaps between the Seljuks of Rum and the Mengujegids. Uh, I mean, with perhaps uh, monuments in, in neighboring cities like uh, Sivas and Malatya. Uh, this is by Alp, uh, Bilgin Alp. Um, Sivas and uh, Malatya. Um... And then there was another question uh -huh. um, about why Saliha Beze, why, why it was built in Divri, not in Sivas. But maybe, I mean, I kind of combined these. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, well, in Sivas, uh, first of all, they're uh, two different, uh, politically speaking, two different uh, entities. <laughs> so Dibri belonged in the Mengujeked uh, realm, um, and Sivas uh, was a, uh, well, previously it was a Danish mandate city, but it was taken by the Seljuks um, in the uh, late, uh, mid to late uh, 12th century. Um, Interestingly, though, Sivas, you know, a nearby city, uh, already had a hospital uh, in, built in 1217. So the decision to have a hospital here may have also been a kind of like, if they have one, we could also have one. <laughs> Maybe there was already a hospital in also Erzinjan, we don't know. Uh, so maybe this was kind of a, um, a trend 
patronage trend uh, and they were following uh, that. Um, yeah, I think it's also interesting that uh, Keika was, I mean, Sivas, I mean, he, he was married to a uh, Mengu Jagid princess. Uh, so there are these interesting kind of relations. Uh, right, they, they, well. they, they marry quite a bit. So, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, yes, it's, there's it's, intermarriage it's, and competition at the same time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, I think it is a competitive environment. Uh, and that's what makes me think with this uh, physician, Abdul Latif El Baghdadi, who traveled uh, and uh, you know, he traveled to these towns and he kind of checked them out. <laughs> clearly. And the patrons too. I'm sure he was yeah. like comparing the patrons um, yeah, comparing as the well patrons as the, <laughs> the institutions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, ultimately he was homesick and he went back so <laughs> to Baghdad. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, he, they were kind of, these are kind of new frontiers, although these cities have been, you know, um, Kind of part of their you know this kind of dynastic power has been present here already like you know over a hundred years by the time this monument was built still from you know someone coming from Baghdad or you know Damascus this is like the the, the, the frontier you know yes. uh, so they they were kind of checking it out so there was must have been a competition to attract some of these major figures uh, as an element of prestige so uh, I see Naz here, but Naz, <laughs> I had one last cluster of questions about heritage, basically, to kind of wrap up. Um, Nebat Avjol asked, questions about heritage may have also made this mosque exceptional. Did the building receive any attention during Ottoman times or only during the Republic and um, its interest in, uh, in the Seljuk past? Um, Michelle Lynch asked, to what extent has the presentation of the building as exceptional influenced local narratives or the memory of the structure? Um, and then Gizam Dardar asks about the cement platform uh, on the west side of the uh, monument. Um, you know, what, do you have any idea what's going on in terms of the, uh, the restoration? So coming to the, the present day. Yeah, the restoration, I believe, is not yet finished, but it should be nearing its end. And uh, I mean, you can, you know, if you Google, <laughs> you could just come up like on very short news items. Oh, they found this or I mean, there aren't even that many of those or they found them. One of the things they found was uh, uh, that uh, so, uh, that in the Ottoman, this goes to the first question, in the Ottoman period, at least uh, we know that the building uh, in the period of um, uh, Sultan Suleiman in the 16th century, uh, it was, well, it was given a minaret, but also a corner buttress uh, to support the building, the western side of the building, which was uh, quite weak and clearly collapsed, maybe more than once. So there has been an Ottoman interest in this building uh, in terms of preserving it. Uh, that's quite clear. Uh, and they did what they thought needed to be done in terms of buttressing it. Uh, and also the interior, this is what you find if you Google the news items. Uh, uh, they find uh, they uh, some of the, the the columns had been kind of strengthened by cladding it with more kind of uh, stone. Um, so they kind of looked in and so oh yeah inside they have the original columns. <laughs> uh, this kind of yeah so clearly there is a kind there was an, a, a continuous Ottoman attempt to maintain this building, uh, not let it go to ruin. Um, although by the time you come to the, uh, there's also like uh, just before the Republic, uh, in the beginning of the 20th century, there was an attempt, there was a, a restoration, uh, I'm not sure what it actually involved, um, and then uh, through the 20th century as well, uh, apparently during World War II, it was used as a storage for uh, uh, works of art from the uh, uh, national palaces, the Mili Saraylar. <laughs> so it was used as a, thought to be a safe location uh, to bring some uh, works of uh, fine art. Uh, and it was kept here briefly. The question about the, 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 the was it the Western platform or the, the Eastern? Uh, the uh, you mean the cement platform? Um... Uh, yes, there were discussions of getting rid of the cement platform on the west side of the monument. I was wondering what happened in terms of restoration on the side yeah, after seeing the photograph. I, I'm not privy uh -huh. to the uh, 
restoration project, I should say. <laughs> so any information that I have, is there anything that anybody can actually- She says, um, I was wondering what happened in terms of restoration. After seeing the photograph of the West portal with the salt marks or originating probably from the cement platform. So mm -hmm. um, maybe yeah, the photographs- that, These uh, photographs that. here are from 2010. Um, but there were some, yeah, interventions on the kind of trying to prop up the area around the building, uh, mm -hmm. going back, I think, to the 60s uh, and later, uh, and the, the eastern side of the building as well. Uh, they put in some uh, concrete uh, kind of pillars. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, I haven't come across any kind of recent report on what is going on there. Uh, maybe once it's completed, hopefully, mm -hmm. uh, we'll have more information. So um, I guess we're, we're out of time. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Oya. And I'd like to thank Anamed uh, once again uh, on, on my behalf. Uh, thank you, Naz. And uh, thank many you. thanks to Chris and Bouquet as, as well uh, for making it a memorable uh, event. So thank you everyone for the questions. I'm sure maybe there were more, but uh, uh, so there's a lot to think about. So thank you all for coming. Definitely, there were more questions, but let's say for now, next time. Yeah. Uh, on to be continued. <laughs> yeah, to be continued. And <laughs> on behalf of Anamet, I would like to also thank you, uh, Dr. Yaman and Dr. Pancaroğlu. Uh, it was a quite interesting and great talk. Uh, and I would like to also thank to our attendees for their interesting questions and for joining us this evening. Um, follow our social media accounts, our website, or subscribe to our email uh, mailing list for our upcoming Anamet talks. I would like to add that. So good morning, good night, wherever you are. <laughs> Thank you again for joining us. And anything else you would like to add? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for Bye, joining. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.